Hey guys and girls, Alish here from GameMediaLab.com. Welcome to my exciting world of live audio mixing. In today's episode, I talk about two different approaches to mixing live sound. One is with mixing with input gain set to a unity gain, and the other one is mixing with faders at zero. I'll talk about how these two approaches came about and what are the differences in the workflow. But before we jump into that, make sure that you have hit the subscribe button and turned on the notifications so that you don't miss any of the new videos that I post every week. With all of that said and done, let's just start the show. Let me just quickly explain the setup that I have here. I will be showing this with 10 channels of drums. The multi-track is already coming into the board. Um, and I will start first by uh, setting the input gains on all channels to a unity level, checking with, with my solo Q bus, um, and then mixing with faders. And then I'll uh, sort of redo it with mixing with faders at zero and I will explain why these two uh, approaches came about and why people use them what are the differences between them so let's start by saying that all of the gains or should I say trims are set to minus 18 just so that we have a clear representation of what I'm doing with these gains nothing is set on these channels so no EQs Everything has been flattened out, no compression. So this is basically just mixing with uh, gains and faders before we do anything else. So the first uh, workflow would be to go to every channel that we have, push on the solo button, and then raise it until we get a reasonably unified level on all channels. When I say reasonably unified level, uh, we have to consider what the console is seeing. These are uh, program peak meters, um, what you are looking at on the meters, but the console needs RMS level. I won't go into detail what that means in this particular video, but what that means is I'm trying to guess the RMS level for all those channels, uh, depending on how much transients there are and a particular signal coming into the board. And that's why I tried to keep them all at minus 20 dB-ish. Not very, uh, I'm not very strict about it. I make informed decisions in terms of how much transients I hear in these signals and then adjust my trims accordingly. But, you know, the quick and easy way would be to sort of say, okay, this channel has to go to... Uh, Let's say minus 15 because we have quite a bit of snare still present. And then the second one, the second overhead. And see, I've started with the overheads because it doesn't really matter what channel I start with because I will be setting all of the input gains at, a, at the same level. Okay, and then I can start with kick. And I will shoot a bit higher with these gains over here because kicks, snares are really, really transient rich sounds. Um, and that would translate into RMS levels with a bit uh, lower values. If I would just set them at, let's say, minus 20, um, that would be a, a bit low for the console to operate correctly, right? And then we're just running through through all of the channels. Okay, just a bit of polarity here. Let's go to the snare.
let's check the polarity of the snare first against the overheads. This is better. Now I'm checking the polarity between the two snares. You can hear the low end coming back. And you can already see that I've pulled down the overheads because I don't need all that um, all that level in the mix. Here's where it gets interesting, right? The hi-hat. If I put this at zero and go, okay, solo and pull it up. You can hear that every time the, the hi-hat comes in, it's really, really loud. So I need to pull it back in the in the mix right and the toms the same way i won't do the toms in this particular session because it just would be too long so let's figure out what happened here so all of the input gains are now set at approximately the same level and the levels in the mix are then adjusted with the faders now why is this a good thing or a bad thing the good thing about this is that whatever I do in terms of signal processing right now, I can apply EQ, I can apply compression, I can apply gate. It should sort of stay relatively the same all across all of the channels. So if I'm running through the board really quickly, that sort of makes it much easier and all the channels will behave approximately the same or very similarly. So all the threshold levels will start grabbing at the same level. All of the gates will start grabbing with the same threshold. All of the EQs will sort of have, you know, the same values in terms of how much is plus six or minus six on a, on a particular filter for every channel. Uh, the downside of it is that you now have all of these faders all across the board. And when you look at a mix, you, you're not particularly sure, um, you know, where those levels are. Plus, um, the resolution of the faders, because these are logarithmic, uh, are not as precise in terms of moves as they would be if everything was sitting at around zero, right? Because this, this is 5 dB, right? This movement, which is about half an inch. But if I'm over here, then, you know, 5 dB is this. So maybe a quarter of an inch. If I go lower than that, that's an eighth of an inch, even lower than that, you know, 16. Um, so you lose the resolution, you lose the detail of fader movement. So even the tiniest uh, fader movements, if they are done over here on the board, will have much larger value discrepancies than if they are run uh, around faders at zero. So less detailed work with the fader, but you get more um, you get more consistency across the board in terms of signal processing. Let's do it the other way around and talk about mixing with faders at zero. Mixing with faders at zero sort of became a standard a long time ago when analog boards were um, on everything that was available at the time. The way faders worked in the analog days was when they were set at zero, they would leave the signal through or leave the signal passed through unattenuated. When something happened in terms of attenuation or addition, those faders would affect the sound by putting some sort of a resistance in the signal path just to allow you to have control over the level. So the actual sound of the console was different if you were running with faders at zero or not. In digital domain, however, this is not uh, an issue because these are basically digital controllers. They don't actually pass any audio through them. With faders at zero mixing, you sort of have to start, if you don't want to go back and redo a lot of these steps with your most prominent signals first. So the loudest signals first, and they will sort of give you a baseline of where your levels will be. And it's basically just that. So you start with 
all of the faders set to zero and now you have a visual representation of your sort of default or zero mix and then we'll go through ch from channel to channel right Okay, notice the hi hat, right? If I would if I were to set it at Unity gain. The trim level would be at around zero, right? If I were to set it for mixing with faders at zero, It's, let's say at, at minus six. So there's a 60 dB difference in the input gain level. Let's go with the overheads. Okay, a bit lower than that. Okay, let's say that we are now satisfied with the mix of the, of the drums. You know, the levels are here. Let me just, okay, this is flipped. That's fine. And we also need to do this. And as we do this, right, the level sort of increased because of the summation between uh, these channels when I flipped the polarity. So maybe I need to reduce the levels a bit. All right, so this would be a difference in approach. Now, when this is done, all of my faders are set at zero, so I have the most detailed uh, options when it comes to now mixing, because, you know, these moves can be really subtle. But um, check out what happened with the levels. So we had most of the levels in the previous example set at around zero dB trim, just because the way the multi-track was recorded. It was recorded um, with the mentality of uh, setting all of the input gains at around unity gain. But now, you know, these are all across the board. So minus five, minus seven, minus two, minus nine on the snare bottom, minus six on the hi-hat. So that means that we have, you know, anywhere between four to six, sometimes even eight dB of difference in terms of the preamp that is hitting the console. What does that mean for the workflow? Well, it it doesn't really matter which approach you take, but you have to know what it does to uh, the console itself. Running this on a digital board um, with failures at zero would probably mean that all of those adjustments for the EQs and compression and gating or whatever processing that you do on the channel will have to be very much individual for each channel. You know, you can't really go across the, the board and say, okay, all of my thresholds for gates will be at minus 22 or 25 or 27 and, you know, ish around that level, but you really have to go um, channel per channel and decide what the best levels are. And you also have to think about A to D conversion. So whatever choice you you decide to do, and I'm not saying that one is better than the other, they are just different sides to the same story, um, but you have to be aware of what are the pros and the cons. So hopefully this sort of illustrated what the differences between two approaches are. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. 
Um, while you're doing that, make sure that you like, share and subscribe to my channel and also to visit GameMediaLab.com for more audio deliciousness. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Take care, mix great shows. Bye.